Hi, I'm Adam Shepherd. And I'm Jane McCallion. And you're listening to the IT Pro Podcast. This week, we'll be talking about the rise of malicious AI, not in the form of killer robots, but as AI-powered cyber attacks. We'll be joined by Darktrace's Director of Threat Hunting, Max Feinemeyer, to discuss how hackers are using this technology and what businesses can do to guard against it. So, Adam, I, I've always been a, a bit of an anti-AI, anti-automation Luddite, if you will, uh, but as uh, recently stated in a column, I've, I'm kind of coming around to the idea as AI as a beneficial thing. So I hope our guest today isn't going to turn me back and running, fleeing away from the, the killer robots who are going to take all our jobs, including the jobs of hackers, apparently. <laughs> Nobody is safe, as it turns out. <laughs> Automation is coming for all of us, even those on the less legal side of the law. <laughs> you will be automated. Resistance is futile. <laughs> Before all that, though, let's take a look at some of this week's top stories. Well, first up, we have the sad news that after 35 years, the venerable Japanese manufacturer Toshiba is formally exiting the laptop market. The company previously spun its laptop subdivision out into the Dynabook brand after Shop bought an 80% stake in Toshiba's laptop business. Shop, a subsidiary of Taiwanese electronics giant Foxconn, has now purchased the remaining 20% of the shares, making Dynabook a wholly owned subsidiary of Shop. Yes, so the Dynabook brand isn't going to disappear completely. It's just not going to be Toshiba's. Um, it's yeah, it is a bit of a shame, as we said. You know, it's thirty-five years since Toshiba put out its first laptop, the T one one zero zero, in nineteen eighty-five, which cost four thousand five hundred and fourteen dollars uh, equivalent in today's money. Um, weighed a whopping 4.1 kilos and came with a slightly less whopping 256 kilobytes of RAM. That's right, that is a princely spec by any standards. <laughs> uh, the recent Dynabooks, uh, jumping forward slightly, have been a little patchy here and there, but largely pretty good as they go. We've reviewed a number of them on the site already. Uh, hopefully this record will continue under Shop's full ownership of the company. As we mentioned, Shop has been the majority owner of Dynabook for the last several years, and hopefully we'll see the continued strong, well, reasonably strong performance of their laptops going forward. Yeah, I can't see it making a, a major difference given that it's effectively been a Sharp venture for, for a while now. It's not you know, a complete turn of direction and sell off to somebody who's not previously been involved. Mm. Having said that, it is, as we've previously mentioned, uh, a little a little sad to see one of the real veterans of the laptop market exiting after such a long tenure. We will miss them and it's sad to see them go. Elsewhere this week, the use of facial recognition by police in the UK has been found to be illegal on the basis that it violates people's right to privacy. The decision comes after a long-running court case over South Wales Police's use of facial recognition vans. That case was brought by former Lib Dem councillor and campaigner Ed Bridges with the support of campaigning group Liberty. The Court of Appeal has ruled that the system, which automatically captures facial recognition data for matching against records of things like outstanding warrants, violates human rights equality laws and data protection laws. The court also noted that there were no safeguards around where the tech was being used and that the police never tried to verify that the system wasn't racially or sexually biased. Yes, which is ridiculous given that that is such a known problem in AI, especially, especially facial recognition AI. It's just, it's incomprehensible that over the course of doing this, at no point did they say, hmm, you know, we might at least be able to make some positive inroads here by assessing the AI that we're using, maybe modifying it a bit in case, you know, there is some kind of problem, which there almost certainly is. Um, and, you know, that's not even to mention the whole privacy thing, which, you know, I agree with. We are over surveilled in this country anyway. You know, there's the whole statistic about, I think, London in particular having the most CCTV cameras of like anywhere. The UK is just known for this. So 
that's not ideal in and of itself. And then having these cameras also kind of trying to recognize who you are and match you against some database is like some dystopian stuff. And particularly given the general climate over the last couple of years around the the police's relationship with race on a global level. Now, it's worth noting that this court case kicked off before the current wave of anti-police protests in the US. But still, the police as an institution does not necessarily have the best record when it comes to racism and not checking Mm. that your AI system doesn't have racial problems when this is a known problem as you mentioned with AI systems seems like a gross oversight. Yeah and you know this is not the only case of its type recently the home office has had to put an AI system in the bin uh, which was supposed to deal with fast tracking visa applications but it turned out was horribly racially biased who would have imagined. Um, Shocker. I know. Uh, It's almost as if AI takes the biases of the people who program it and the data that they're given, which is a bunch of junk. uh, But what has always seemed really weird to me about this case is just how tight South Wales police are to using it. Like, they could have just kind of gone, fine, we'll put it under review or something equally kind of fig leafy for, you know, okay, fine, we'll take it off. Do you know do you know what I think it is? Mm. I think it's like when you buy a really fancy barbecue and you end up having <laughs> a barbecue like every other day to try and justify the ridiculous amount of money that you've spent on it or when you buy a fancy sandwich toaster and end up having toasties for like every meal. It's also possibly worth noting that while this is the South Wales police who are involved in this case the Welsh Police Force, the Hesley in general, do come out and support the Metropolitan Police and other police forces in policing protests. So there is, I guess, the possibility that this wasn't just being used in, say, you know, Cardiff and Swansea and stuff, but potentially the country more widely, or that could have been the plan. Hmm. It will be interesting to see what impact this ruling has on the future use of AI within policing and whether or not there is any future for it at all. Yeah, I agree. Finally this week, Microsoft's take on the foldable phone will be arriving in less than a month. The Surface Duo will be launching on the 10th of September with a starting price of $1,399. Yes, it is a US exclusive for now, but a wider release is expected. And it's a bit of a different take on foldable phones. You know, rather than having one screen that you then bend in half, it's two distinct screens separated by a hinge. So a bit more like a book, I guess. Yeah, it's notable because one of the biggest problems with foldable phones as they have thus far been released is that the bend in the screen introduces a rather significant fault line. Numerous devices have suffered from problems of one kind or another with <laughs> the the bendy bit of the screen, whereas this take on the, on the concept removes that problem pretty much. Yeah, uh, problems is uh, a very euphemistic way of putting the <laughs> catastrophically, oh no, my phone is broken. Um, unsurprisingly, perhaps uh, first party Microsoft apps such as Office, Edge, Teams and so on have been optimised for the format. Yeah, I'm, I for one am really excited by this device. I'm more excited for the Surface Neo, which is the larger version of this form factor coming from Microsoft, although that's not scheduled to arrive until next year, rumours indicate. Uh, but this certainly looks like a, a much more utilitarian take on the foldable phone and one that will be, I suspect, more genuinely useful to people's lives than the other examples that we've seen thus far. I mean, I'm I'm excited because, as I think I've probably mentioned uh, before on the podcast, that I used to have Windows 10 Mobile and was apparently the only person in the country, possibly the world, who really liked that operating system and those phones. The operating system was never the problem, though. The problem was a complete lack of third-party support for apps and whatnot. Now, this isn't set to be a problem with this one because Microsoft has finally seen sense and decided to release an Android-based device. 
Ah, uh, because that's what I was going to say. What is this I know based it on? Was. <laughs> we know each other so well. Um, well, that's kind of that's quite helpful. Although, you know, it's not gonna. It's clearly not going to call me back from my switch to uh, to the iPhone, given that it won't have my beloved Windows eight esque tiled interface that I just once again was possibly the only person who really liked that. <laughs> I still think you're mad, 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 mad for <laughs> actually enjoying Windows Mobile, for the record. It's time for a break now, but afterwards we'll be hearing from Dark Traces' Max Heinemeyer on the growing role of criminal AI. Welcome back. It's no secret that AI is increasingly creeping into modern business, with more and more companies deploying both off-the-shelf and custom-made artificial intelligence solutions to try and gain a competitive edge. But as security experts are keen to point out, technology is a tool, and it can often be used for criminal purposes just as easily as legitimate ones. Here to discuss the potential threat of AI-enabled cyber attacks is the director of threat hunting at Darktrace, Max Heinemeyer. Max, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So, Max, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself and the work that you do at Darktrace? Sure, Jane. I used to be an ethical hacker for 10 years before I joined over to defending companies rather than hack into them ethically. And here at Darktrace, I lead the analyst team, the Threat Hunters, based in Cambridge, and work with our big strategic and important clients on a day-to-day -day basis. Can I just say, that is one of the cooler titles I've heard in the security world. Isn't it? I picked it myself. It's always a nice <laughs> icebreaker in conversations. I can imagine. So legitimate businesses are increasingly making use of AI. It's becoming increasingly common in sort of anti-malware, that kind of thing. Are hackers making use of AI in the same way that security teams and indeed security companies are? Partially, yes. So it all comes down to the same tools and algorithms in AI. It could be supervised machine learning, it could be unsupervised machine learning. All kinds of AI is being used in defensive tools these days to different degrees of effectiveness. But if we look at offensive AI, that's what we call the use of AI purposes for malicious attacks. We definitely see a trend in different applications and using the same tools and underlying technologies like the good guys in the defensive side of things. So can you expand a bit on this idea of the tools and techniques that they are using? Oh, absolutely. I like to think, being a former hacker myself, around the attack lifecycle, right? Every cyber attack goes through various phases and generic steps. Initial reconnaissance, what is Jane doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Where does she work? What's her hobbies? What's her background? Where did she study? And then trying to hack into people, sending spear phishing emails, sending malicious links, sending malware, then exfiltrating data and making use of that data, or maybe using ransomware. And we see across the whole attack lifecycle, AI being used, or possibly being used in the near future, for malicious purposes. And I've got various examples here. Um, so if you think about the early stages of an attack, which is very interesting to most people, the social engineering side of things. So when I want to hack into somebody, I might want to send a spear phishing email. And I'm sure everybody's got friends and family who got hit by phishing scams and spear phishing. And normally, being a hacker here, putting our black hat on, what I do is I do reconnaissance. I understand my victim organization, my human victims. I want to know where they work and all these things. And then I craft, based on that, a spear phishing email according to the topics they talk about, according to the themes they normally discuss online, according to their job title, the hierarchy in the organization. Now, most of what I just described could be and can be easily be automated using offensive AI. So instead of crawling through LinkedIn and cr crossing and Facebook and Twitter myself to understand what topics people tweet about and talk about and if they're interested in bicycles or offensive AI or podcasting, I can have this done by natural language processing neural networks to do the heavy lifting there for me. And there's actually some tools out there which can prototype this. One is called snap underscore R, snapper. It's already two or three years old. It's a prototype to show spear tweeting. So instead of trying to send spear phishing tweets to a person by understanding their profile and what they talk about and their hobbies, I can just point this tool at my victim and it goes through all the tweeting profiles, understands all of these things and suggests spear phishing tweets. The interesting bit here is it doesn't have to be better than a human, but it can scale much more and much more easily than a human being. 
As a hacker, I can maybe spare fish or spear tweet two or three people a day. Using this tool, I can do it with hundreds a day. Oh, wow. Mm. I think that's a really interesting point because in the business world, one of the biggest applications we've seen for AI is as a force multiplier, being able to automate kind of fairly tedious manual tasks you know, with rapid efficiency so you can get through a much higher volume using AI than you would be if you were doing them by hand, as it were. And the knowledge that that can be applied to cyber attacks is almost a little bit scary. It's almost like predictive phishing. Mm -hmm. It's a paradigm change that we're up against that's going to happen in the near future if it hasn't happened already. So the interesting bit is, think a bit further, right? When we think about the Twitter hack that happened quite recently, we know that there was access to some high-profile accounts, but it was still quite manual, just a few have been picked out. Imagine the hackers who had access to basically almost every Twitter profile in the world didn't just rummage through it manually, but push it through a neural network, like maybe Yahoo's not safe for work NSFW network that looks for juicy images, adult content, and things like that. So you can speed up the analysis process looking for things you can use for ransoming people, extortion, basically to the nth degree and automate that. And Adam, you touched upon a very interesting point here. We think it's going to lower the barrier to entry for threat actors. It's going to be the paradigm shift because it's going to enable a lot of low-level threat actors with maybe not huge amounts of tech knowledge to enter the cybercrime market and start phishing, malware attacks and all these nasty things. I was going to ask about barrier to entry, actually, but in terms of like financial barrier to entry, I guess I'm guilty, despite the fact that I follow, for example, Janelle Shane and actually a lot of Twitter, like AI bot funny um, accounts. I've always still kind of think of sophisticated AI as being expensive. So has there been financially a drop in the barrier to entry that you know, enables your common or garden hacker to take advantage of this technology and launch AI-powered attacks. Indeed. And I think you mentioned earlier, Jane, that you sometimes feel like we're living in a dystopian future. And I mm -hmm. think the same living in a cyberpunk novel here by William Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> but we've seen this in both ways, right? We've seen it also in the defensive side of things. Some people used to think AI is something you adopt at the very end of the maturity curve. Only if you've got every bell and whistle in place, you can use these very advanced AIs to get the last percentage of security. Now, that's not true. Even if you're quite immature, you can use AI to boost your security massively. And the barrier to entry to use defensive or offensive AI has dropped magnificently. And that's partially because AI has been such a hot buzzword in business. Mm. And, you know, there's been a lot of research funding happening. Many people study it now. There's a lot of open source tools and research. So getting started with it is not to it's not closed for an exclusive community. Anybody who's got a bit of time at their hands could pick up um, scikit-learn, an open source Python library, and start creating their own AI algorithms. And there's loads of open university courses to get the knowledge required. So the barrier to entry to get this started is actually quite low and constantly lowering because of the infrastructure and processes put in place. Now, one of the things that we've talked about both on the site and on the podcast uh, a couple of times is the commodification of cybercrime tools, things like ransomware as a service, malware as a service, kind of off the shelf cyber attack tools that can be used by, as you mentioned, people with minimal technical knowledge to mount what are you know, pretty sophisticated and effective cyber attacks. How far along in that curve are AI tools like the ones you've been describing? Are these kind of AI services available as a kind of pre-rolled package? It really depends on what part of the kill chain and the attack we look at. So we're not at the stage yet, at least to our knowledge, where you can go to the darknet and hire a neural network to compute, you know, the spear phishing attacks for you. But you can certainly go to open source projects and just grab the code yourself and go and run your own neural networks to conduct the attacks. So we're not as mature in the offensive AI tools as we are in the traditional criminal hacking tools, but we're definitely getting there just because there's so much research pumped into this and there's a lot of similar tools being released by researchers every other day. 
Yeah, one of the things that I find most interesting about the security community in general is how much information sharing goes on, not just between defenders in terms of sharing new uh, attack methodologies that they've seen or new defensive capabilities, but also on the black and grey hat side. I mean, you know, black hat in particular, the conference, is always home to fascinating talks on newly discovered exploits or on different ways of, of thinking about carrying out attacks. And a lot of information sharing goes on behind the scenes as well in things like hacking forums and whatnot. And I, I suppose I've never really thought about how much technical information sharing also happens. You know, people developing new technical tools and processes you know, using things like AI. It's a hugely interesting debate in the industry, especially if you think about the release of almost out-of-the-box functioning hacking tools. Might be, might it be exploits, might it be command control frameworks, might it be mock malware to use in security testing. And we always have the opinion in the industry that it's good to release these things. Full disclosure, right? If we release it, people can defend against it. But the reality looks slightly different in many cases, because while in theory you can take these malicious or these or purpose tools and test if you can defend against them, only quite mature companies will actually do this. Your mom and pop shop around the corner with an internet presence and an email server, they won't be able to run the latest PowerShell Cobalt Strike framework to see if they can defend themselves against it. So there's definitely an asymmetry and we can expect the same when we think about offensive AI tools being released. Maybe the most mature companies are going to benefit from this and they can see if they can defend themselves against this, but it's going to be a lot of suffering in the lower ends of the maturity curve if these things are being released without any considerations about it being ethical or safe. Actually, to the point where at Darktrace here, we obviously use defensive AI to defend our customers. And we have created interesting offensive AI tools, which we haven't released because it would be very unethical to test our own systems, almost to the point of having, if I want to be a hyperbole here, a war of algorithms where we test our offensive <laughs> AI to go against our defensive AI. Wow. Does this trend uh, of hackers using AI or you know, the potential there uh, change what businesses need to look out for when they're defending themselves? Yeah, absolutely. We still see many businesses taking the ostrich approach. I'm too small to be hacked. I won't be a victim. I don't have interesting data. Nobody can profit off of hacking me. And it doesn't work anymore when attackers can scale their attacks to basically hit anybody anywhere with very sophisticated attacks. So we can expect that security isn't just a nice to have and you can use the ostrich approach to hope nothing happens to you, but it's going to be a necessity to do digital business. And I think we see it in some cases. For example, we've seen travel lags after being hit by a ransomware attack going into administration now. So the impact of cybercrime can be immense for companies. So Max, with all this talk of offensive AI, how can businesses use defensive AI to combat it? I think there's two sides. While using defensive AI is a necessity going forward, they also should think about cyber hygiene, right? Just the basics, get the basics right, look at the NCSC's website, look for the best practices and get the low hanging fruits done. But it's also quite important to look at the quite advanced solutions like defensive AI to implement because defensive AI, the longer it's in place, the more it learns, the better, better it gets over time, the more data it has to look into. And we're already predicting a war of algorithms because Already we see that most attacks are heavily automated. We already see malware fully automated combating firewalls, antivirus, some defensive logging and monitoring systems. So this will just be exacerbated, this automation, by the introduction of offensive AI. And it's going to become eventually a war of algorithms like we mentioned before, because you will see that the defensive AI has the upper hand in terms of data, in terms of oversight, in terms of more history of the environment, and thus can battle and win against the offensive AI. I think, it, I think it's important that we see defensive AI on the rise now being adopted left, right and center, partially um, thanks to Darktrace for pushing this. But there's clearly something wrong with the current state and the former state of play in IT security. I mean, everybody's been preaching the same things for the last 25 years, right? Security awareness training, firewalls, antivirus, static rules. And where's it gotten us? 
people still get hacked, even the biggest companies with the biggest budgets in the world still get hacked. So we don't just anticipate a paradigm shift in the offensive side of things, but we need this paradigm shift that's currently happening in the defensive world using AI to combat threats. Well, I'm afraid we'll have to bring our discussion to a close there, but thanks once again to Max Heinemeyer for joining us. Jane, Adam, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Don't forget to follow IT Pro on social media and subscribe to the IT Pro newsletter for daily updates. You can also subscribe to the Business Briefing newsletter for a weekly download of all the financial and business news you need. If you want to support the podcast, leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or share the show on social media. And we'll be back next week with more IT news and insight. But until then, goodbye. Bye. The IT Pro Podcast is brought to you by the Dennis Podcast Network.